How many of you came tonight knowing exactly who I am and thinking you know exactly what I'm going to say? I'm an individualist feminist, which is a tradition within individual, which in feminism that you may not be tr familiar with. It's also called libertarian feminism. And I'm going to open in an unconventional manner by speaking about my personal background. I've had a great deal of violence in my life. When I was 16, I ran away from home and lived on the street. I was raped, and brutally so. I did not blame the society. I did not blame the culture. I blamed the man who raped me. I've had reason in my life to blame other men. In my 20s, due to a, a, a domestic violence incident, I had a hemorrhage in the central line of vision of my right eye that left me legally blind. I did not blame society. I did not blame culture. I blamed the man who put his fist in my face. Every morning I wake up, I know the pain and the importance of violence against women because I see half of the world because of it. I am bringing this up before I bring up the arguments and the evidence because when a woman like me comes and disagrees with the feminist orthodoxy, what comes back are accusations. I don't know what it means, the significance, the importance of the violence against women. I trivialize rape. Let's put that behind us. Let's say that I am a woman who knows intimately the pain of sexual violence, and that I disagree. Let's put that behind us and do the one thing that is most important in this issue, which is actually discuss the issues, raise questions. This evening, I'll address two topics all too briefly, the rape culture, and how I think sexual assault accusations on campus should be treated. So the rape culture. A conflict within feminism about the rape culture came into focus on February 28th of this year when the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, known as RAIN, the largest anti-sexual anti -sexual violence organization in America and, and the most influential and hardly a voice of conservatism. Rain sent a 16-page letter to a new White House task force that had the mission of reforming and standardizing campus reform hearings across America. Rain stated, and I quote, there has been an unfortunate trend toward blaming rape culture for the extensive problem of sexual violence on campus. While it is helpful to point out the systemic barriers to addressing the problem, it is important not to lose sight of a simple fact. Rape is caused not by cultural factors, but by the conscious decisions of a small fraction of a community to commit a violent crime. While that may seem an obvious point, it has tended to get lost in recent debates." End quote. Rain argued that focusing on the, quote, rape culture made it harder to stop sexual violence since it removed the focus from the individual at fault and seemingly mitigates personal responsibility for his or her own actions. I agree. The treatment of rape needs to move away from what has become the status quo assumption of feminist orthodoxy, away from rape as an expression of culture, and toward holding a small number of individuals absolutely responsible for their actions. Men or women as a category do not rape. Individuals do. And yet, this idea runs counter to the whole idea and the whole discussion of rape culture. You speak of a rape culture, you're saying that rape is so widely accepted that it is a cultural norm. 
In short, it is a defining aspect of society. And certainly there are cultures in which that definition fits. There are parts of Afghanistan, for example, where, the, where women are married against their will, they are murdered for men's honor, they are raped, and when they are raped, they are arrested for it, and they're shunned by their family afterward. Now that's a rape culture, but that is not North America. It doesn't resemble North America. Here, rape is a crime that is severely punished. Even an accusation of sexual harassment can ruin someone's career and their lives. A few days ago, I saw a sight that made me just wither inside. A man who had a scientist behind the Rosetta comet landing, Matt Taylor, wept an apology on TV because after the biggest achievement of his life, he basically was hounded because he wore a shirt that a female friend of his had made that showed cartoon superheroines on it. And he was made to weep in apology on TV rather than revel in an incredible accomplishment. Who had the power there? Did he have the power there? Feminists came and said that he basically should be excoriated, and he wept on TV. It was, a, it was a terrible sight. It was a cruel sight. The messages sent to men today are not that it's okay to rape. It's the opposite. And according to both Rain and the Department of Justice, the rate of rape and sexual assault has decreased by more than half since 1993, so why aren't we celebrating? North America is not a rape culture, and it is an insult to women who live in one that women here with so much freedom and so much opportunity are trying to share the same status with them. I often hear statistics meant to prove to me that things are far, far worse for women here than I'm making out. But there's a problem with the statistics used to support a rape culture. Many researchers have tried to find out where they come from, what they're based on, and it is an incredibly hard task. For example, a recently circulated claim is that 8% of college men have either attempted or successfully raped. And I'll be dwelling on this stat for a reason. Some associates and I have tried to track it down and when it's, it's typical of what happens over and over again when people try to track down these stats and, and, and find out where are they based, what are they rooted in. A key reason why I find no evidence for systemic rape culture, only evidence of rapes committed by individuals, is because the, the, the data doesn't exist. We trace the figure back to a book entitled Body Wars by the clinical psychologist Margot Main. Uh, to quote from the book, quote, 8% uh, of college men have either attempted or successfully raped. 30% say they would rape if they could get away with it. When the wording was changed to force a woman to have sex, the number jumped to 58%. Worse still, 83.5% argued that some women look like they are just asking to be raped, end quote. I stumbled when I first read the 83%. 0.5% figure because it seemed improbable to, improbable to me that a scientifically based study, first of all, would ask that question, and second of all, that would be the result. And again, I'm a woman who's known an unusual amount of violence. I'm hardly naive on this subject. When the National Post, which is a major Canadian paper, decided to follow up on the questions we were raising about the stats in Maine's book, a reporter contacted her. She was largely unable to give her sources. There was one study she reported, and to quote the book again, in one study over half of high school boys and nearly half of the girls stated that rape was acceptable if the male was sexually aroused, end quote. No one, including Maine, was able to come up with that study. No one has found it yet. When pressed, Maine emailed the National Post 
basically saying she didn't know where it came from, uh, she didn't know why it hadn't been cited, and she was too busy to bother. Well, I'm too busy to bother giving it credibility. And by the way, I, bought, I brought the article, if anyone's interested in the forensics of the attempt to get the stats. Returning to the 8% figure, Maine said it came from another work published in 1988. This was a reference to the extremely influential study conducted by Mary Koss, which was popularized in 1988 through the book, I Never Called It Rape, the Miss Study on Recognizing, Fighting, and Surviving Date and Rape Acquaintance by Robin Warshaw. There are so many problems with the Coase study. For one thing, Coase herself admits that only 27% of the women that she had counted as rape victims considered themselves to have been raped. 49% said the sexual encounter in question had been the result of miscommunication, not rape. Coase ignored the voices of these women and redefined their experiences to fit her own studies. And that's a problem. If you don't find that to be a problem, then I find it to be a problem you call yourself a feminist. Again, I've dwelled on tracking down the 8% stat because it's a key reason feminists like me reject the rape culture. It's because you look at the stats, you look at the data, it's extremely biased, it's badly flawed, or it is not there. And perhaps the factual weakness is a reason why the rhetoric surrounding a rape culture is so hyperbolic. I even find the term rape culture to be hyperbolic. It seems to prevent the productive dialogue that includes healthy questioning. And that's a shame, because as a rape survivor, and like I said, I've gone through hell with a lot of violence in my life. As a survivor, I want to know the truth about sexual assault in our society. I don't want politics. I don't want ideology. I want the truth. And I want it for a simple reason. Rape is a hideous crime and it is never going to be deterred until we deal with its reality, not its politics, but its reality. I'll move on now and focus on how I believe universities should handle accusations of rape. But one thing I'm not going to discuss, at least not in my talk, uh, certainly in Q&A, are the stats on how many rapes or how many false accusations occur. And again, there's a simple reason. If even one rape occurs, it raises exactly the same question as if 100 rapes occur. And that's how do we handle it. If even one false accusation occurs, it raises exactly the same question as if a hundred occur. How do we handle it? How do we prevent an innocent person, almost certainly a man, from becoming a victim? So what's the best way to ensure a rape victim receives justice? My answer, which is simplistic and unsatisfying to both me and to you, it's a criminal offense. Go to the police. Rape is a crime. It's, it's, not, it's not an infraction of, co of college policy. They're trained to investigate and process it, and they usually, often, maybe, they do a piss poor job. I don't argue with that. But I think they do a better job than bureaucrats, academics, many of whom are ideologically biased, and under federal marching orders not to use criminal or exacting standards of investigation. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. If students want to make a difference in the justice with which rape victims are treated, then you should be protesting at police departments and outside courtrooms if you did that and you changed the efficiency or the attitude with which law enforcement approached rape,
then you wouldn't be helping just yourselves. You'd be helping every woman in America. Every woman would be in your debt. But that's not going to happen. Because there is an extreme political push behind campus hearings. Arguably, the push began in April 2011 when the Department of Education informed campuses that they needed to comply with new standards for adjudicating sexual assault if they wanted to receive federal funding, and everyone does. Even private universities are under great pressure to conform to what's becoming the standard on all campuses. The new standard deprives an accused of legal protections, such as the presence of counsel and the right to cross-examine an accuser. The criminal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, which was used to ascertain guilt, was scrapped in favor of the civil standard of a preponderance of the evidence. And that means that hearing officials are 50.1% convinced that one side is more likely to be true than the other. In other words, a student can be found guilty of rape by the same standard of evidence that traffic courts use to adjudicate parking tickets. The federal pressure on campuses continues. On September 3rd, NPR reported, quote, more than 70 campuses are under federal investigation for violating the civil rights of alleged victims. And some students say schools are running so scared that they're violating the due process rights of defendants instead." End quote. Earlier this month, the Department of Education accused Princeton of violating anti-discrimination laws because the university was one of the last holdouts on, re on reducing the standard of proof in rape hearings. In the settlement, they caved, as, as of course they, they would have to. They lowered their standards. The conflict is heating up on both sides. The organization of Voice for Male Students recently issued, listed 42 lawsuits brought by students against universities for violating their rights in hearings. The real figure is closer to, to 50. And there will be more. And there will be a Supreme Court challenge. Believe me. A common response to such criticism is that the hearings are not legal proceedings. And although this is technically true, I find it disingenuous. The hearings actually operate in a legal gray zone. For example, the most recent federal instructions on how to conduct hearings include improved cooperation with the police. What this means, I don't know. No one does yet. It comes from the uh, new White House task force that was formed in January. Moreover, the testimony an accused gives at a hearing can be turned over to the police and can be used against him in court, even though he has no legal representation, he has no due process, he has no ability to truly defend himself, for example, by asking questions of his accuser. The so-called non-legal hearings can impose penalties as draconian as any court. A student can be expelled with the word rapist permanently in his file, tens of thousands of dollars in debt. He may have no prospect of getting a license for a lawyer, being a lawyer, a doctor, whatever he, he dreamed of. He is effectively barred from many other unlicensed professions. What university of quality is going to accept him? His reputation is destroyed. And having spoken to some of the men who are bringing lawsuits against universities, I know the extraordinary pain they go through then and now, and will probably live with the rest of their lives. And yet, for the sake of argument, let me grant that hearings are not legal proceedings and then shift ground. The fact that an adjudication is not legal does not release it or the people involved in it from the moral and the professional responsibility to be fair. There is what you legally must do, and then there is common decency. 
Common decency is a debt that you owe to every other human being, whether they are male or female, whether they are black or white, whether they are gay or otherwise. It is especially important when you are exercising power over the lives of other human beings. And a basic tenet of fairness is that you do not condemn or punish a person without objectively weighing evidence and allowing them to defend themselves. I said I wasn't going to comment on false accusations, uh, not the stats, but I need to comment on the existence of false accusations. If not their frequency, then their existence. Please finish your thought. People lie. Men lie. Women lie. Feminists lie. Yesterday, I read about the drunken video that was meant to dramatize the rape culture. The video went viral, and it showed a supposedly drunk young woman asking various men for assistance. The men made sexual suggestions instead. Then the LA Weekler revealed that the men had been paid, their lines had been scripted. It was a hoax. People lie, men lie, women lie, feminists lie. Do not build justice for women on injustice for men. Thank you.